Welcome back. It's time for Black and White, and today we're focusing on the anniversary of the district attack where 21 Kenyans lost their lives. And joining the conversation today is Loisa Kello, a psychologist, and uh, Henry Kidaiga, uh, uh, who, who is a Ducet survivor. So you experienced the whole thing. And we are going to take, a, because we have a psychologist here, we're going to take a, a look at the effects of this type of attack because we have suffered a few more attacks earlier this year. And we just want to know how can people people here where are people the survivors have been talking a lot it, various news agencies have been focusing on this and it is one year on a lot of healing has taken place physically but psychologically a lot of people do not feel like they're there yet so how can we help them heal and of course how can we better understand their plight of survivors of as survivors of terrorist attacks and I'll start with you Mr. Givaiga. Um what was your experience uh it's sometimes it's hard uh, to explain because it was a normal day mm -hmm. and i'm hoping we don't yeah. trigger yeah. you by taking you back to that particular day yeah. but for the sake of the show and of course those who want to understand what that day was like for you i'd like you to go back there yes yeah uh, th that's okay yeah. so i remember it was a normal day mm -hmm. uh, the 15th of january a tuesday yeah. we were just starting off uh, the year at the time uh, i had not come back to the media i was working at a company called red house public relations mm -hmm. and at the beginning of the year what you normally do is you prepare for new business that you want to acquire so we were working actually on a new business pitch right. mm. and i remember going for lunch at around one o'clock meeting up with one of my friends uh, who is also a lucid survivor and we had agreed to even have coffee mm -hmm. uh, at uh, the restaurant downstairs. Mm -hmm. but the because one that was the, the epicenter of yes. the whole thing. Uh -huh. and, but because uh, it's the beginning of the year and you're planning so much, we had a pitch the next day, I told her, can we do a rain check? Mm -hmm. Remember going back to the office and at around uh, 3.30, we mm -hmm. had the explosion. Mm -hmm. And it catches you unaware, but then you also realize the real power of the human mind, because within seconds, you, you process so much. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was a fire marshal at the time. Okay. And having been a former journalist, I knew the difference between an explosion and a gas, because mm -hmm. most people thought it was a gas explosion. So the first time I looked outside, I told people, no fire in the air, no heat wave, so that means it must be a bomb mm. and I tried to clear people from uh, from our office and it's really curious the kind of things people would want to go back for their phone their handbag yeah. everybody sometimes you think it's a drill mm -hmm. nobody believes it's it's a surreal it's moment happening, yeah. yeah so then um, I led people uh, out of our building I told them we are only using the fire exit some people already had used the main stairwell and as they walked out to the front of the building they were confronted by, by their the attackers and because of that, they started coming back into the building, including the guys who used the fire escape. Um, so at that time, I, I thought I'd gotten a, quite a number of people out and mm -hmm. I was on my, my way out myself. And then people told me, no, they're gunshots, let's go back inside. Okay. And then we hold up inside the room. Mm -hmm. And I think what companies need to understand is there are certain measures that we do willingly or unwillingly mm -hmm. that tend to impact. Um, how staff feel safe during such events. Yes. So we walked into our then CEO's office. It had the usual biometric mm -hmm. from both the inside and the outside. Right. Uh, so we, we went inside the room. Someone said, close the door. The first person closed, the, uh, the last person in closed the door. Mm -hmm. But as it so happened, some of my friends were coming back up oh, the so stairs. They were Left so they were, out. yeah, they were left out of the CEO's office, and it is really a hard moment for you to tell your colleague, "We've tried opening the door, we, we can't. can't open." So you go find somewhere else to, to hide. hide. You feel as if you are sending them out to the wolves. sort of uh, die. Sorry, um, a bit hard to remember. So then, when while we were inside, we took advantage of the tools we had. I'm a former journalist, so I called my friends in the media. I told them, "This is what is happening." Right. Then I also remembered um, my obligation to my family. Called my brother, told him, your mother cannot find out about this on TV. Mm -hmm. So you call her, tell her what's her. happening, walk her through the process. And if I don't make it, just know you are the one who will take over and take care of everything. Mm. Uh, called my then uh, girlfriend, who is uh, now my wife, mm. um, told her what was happening. She thought it was a joke at first, yeah. till she saw it on yeah, TV. Yeah, because nobody expects yeah. this to happen to them. Or someone they know, you yeah. know, um, and that's the most one of the most surreal things about yesterday. Because yesterday, a lot of survivors um, 
thoughts. There would be, you know, that sort of everybody uh, crying out and saying, oh, what happened to the Ducid survivors? But mm -hmm. most of them found themselves sort of alone. They, they didn't, you know, um, as much as most of them don't like the attention mm -hmm. that comes with it, most of them felt, so, uh, I was speaking to some of my colleagues and they felt, oh, everybody seems to have moved on. Yes. And it is a recurring theme that you get even from the uh, Westgate survivors mm -hmm. and survivors of other attacks. Mm -hmm. But a word of caution, if you're ever going through an attack, just remember everybody's going through it in a different way. Right. So yes. could, you, could you walk us to the point where you got rescued? How, how, how long were you holed up in this particular room? And then what was your saving grace? Okay. So and, we and were you, did, were you, was the room, did the attackers ever make it anywhere close to the room? Okay. Yeah. So um, while we were inside the room, um, and that's why I mentioned that you must realize that everyone is going through a different experience. Yeah. One of my colleagues, um, their father had been in the uh, cooperative building when the, the, the US embassy was blown up. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was a different yeah. experience. Yeah. The, guy, the rest of us are getting calls to tell us, hide, stay safe. He's getting calls to tell him, get out. Yes. And his instinct is also get out. And I remember we were hiding uh, in, the, in the office we were hiding in, there was a toilet. Mm. And so I sequestered him in the toilet and told everybody else, just stay outside. Because yes. you could see he's agitated, he's mm. undergoing his own panic attack, because it's different for him. Mm. Uh, for us, this is... It's like maybe, history is repeating yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody he talks to tells him, get out. And every instinct in his body tells him, get out. But if he tries to get out, he didn't pledge everybody else and himself. Mm -hmm. So you try to get him to calm down. And that's when you realize that um, there are also opportunities for you to help others in right. this sort of attacks. But, and I'm sure she'll mention later, there are other factors still going through your mind, mm -hmm. uh, things like survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. And people think survivor's guilt is only after the attack. But for those people who, uh, who have obligations like fire marshals, security guards, they're the guys who clear the building. Mm -hmm. So while they're inside seated um, and, uh, and they are safe or they made it out, they were leading a few people out, they still start remembering. For example, I remember myself remembering, what about all those people the I told to go out? Away, yeah. yeah, The guys, actually, not even mm. the people you evacuated, yeah. did they make it? Mm. And no, no one will call you, tell you I made it at this time. So you're thinking, what if I send someone to their death? What if I... But you are just being reactionary. You're just being... And after the attack, I remember speaking to um, a psychiatrist and mm. telling them, you know, my biggest fear mm -hmm. is that if it happens again, mm -hmm. I wouldn't try to help anyone. And it's such an integral part of sometimes who you are. Mm -hmm. I'm a firstborn. For us, you're always trying to look out for everyone else before you look out for yourself. Right. And you feel that during such attacks, you also lose a part of your identity. Mm -hmm. So I, I've always thought maybe if the atta an attack would happen again, I'd just run for myself and mm -hmm. not care about anyone else, which is really erodes part of you. And you feel there's sort of a uh, conflict uh, within mm -hmm. you. So for us, we were inside for about... Um, one hour, 30 minutes, we were rescued at around five. Mm -hmm. But all through that time, uh, luckily, you know, there are three reactions to an attack. Yeah. You'd have um, flight, freeze, or fight. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd, different people went through those experiences at the same time. Uh, one of my colleagues walked out, uh, ran out, mm -hmm. and just as they got out, the attackers were coming down. And in that moment, they just froze. So they didn't keep running? So they didn't keep running, but because everyone else was running, they nudged them back into action. They scared mm. them. They yeah. sort of were able to kick start her mechanism and she ran. Mm -hmm. And our building was the first building. So she ran uh, around the building and tried to come back round, round it, mm. only to meet other attackers okay. coming down. Mm. So. She, uh, she was now told, do I run back where I've seen, have guns? seen the others or should I? Yeah, this side, uh, they are attackers. But also it speaks to being security aware mm -hmm. of if an attack happened, where, where would you run, I run to? to? Yeah, where so, do I run mm, to? You yeah. guys who are holed up, how did you get uh, to the point that the attackers were, uh, you know, neutralized, then you got out or how... How was it that you eventually got out? Okay, so for us, uh, we were holed up in one end of the building, mm. and we, uh, the, the, our our floor, 
the entire floor belonged to our company. Yes. So there were two doors, one to each wing. Mm. So lucky for us, the last person to walk into our wing closed the glass door. Uh -huh. So um, I remember at some point people being advised, barricade the door. Mm. And at that point, I tried to sort of uh, get up and uh, look around through the door. Yes. And I saw uh, it was about seven minutes after the attack had started. Mm -hmm. The attackers had come back into our wing. Right. And I told people, don't push anything. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at least we spark, we, we, we trigger some, uh, we, yeah. we, we alert them to our presence. Mm -hmm. So we were also communicating on the office WhatsApp group. Mm -hmm. Our colleagues who got out uh, had already gotten in touch with the police. Okay. And they were able to know where we were. So I'd like to bring in Mrs. Uh, Okello. When you hear his story, because I'd like the details of the horrors that he went through to come out, what then is the post-traumatic stress, as we hear it being called, that comes with that? And when you listen to all the stories that have been covered about the survivors, you realize that they are not well. And when people make jokes about World War III, they, they feel like nobody understands how serious this could be. So what are the... What is the fallout, psychological fallout from such an attack? Um, I really want to appreciate and happy new year. Happy new year. Um, it's um, coming out so real to me because I was one of the lead counselors, mm -hmm. both in the Garissa attack and the Ducit. Okay. And um, as um, he speaks, the reality mm -hmm. of what happened, you know, comes in, and uh, it could overwhelm. But I want to simplify it by saying that any human being that is faced with a threat mm. to their life and they are seeing that they may not make it mm. through any situation, it becomes a deep challenge to their mind. And that threat and that um, situation sort of like continues mm. in their minds and thoughts. And as they walk through, it takes quite a bit of uh, you know, support mm -hmm. and assurance for them, for the mind to come back and know that they are now yeah. safe. And what triggers them? Let's say, I've talked about the, the <coughs> jokes about talking about World War Three, mm -hmm. the people who uh, even call each other way al-Shabaab. I mean, to Others, it's, it's, it's a light thing, but then to most people, these turn out, to, to those people who survive, these turn out, turn into triggers. So what goes through their minds? Maybe they hear an explosion and they, they, they cringe like people who have been from war. So what happens in their minds when they, they, they're after the attack, when they've survived, they're safe, but then their minds are not there? Yeah, just like I've said, mm. when any human being is threatened mm. by anything, yes. their life is threatened mm. so that they get to a place where they actually see like they will, their lives will be They're going ended. to die, basically. They're going to die. Yeah. There's usually that which has threatened their mm -hmm. lives. So for him, he said very well, I had the explosion. Mm. So the mind registers that threat. Mm -hmm. And when the mind registers that threat, it becomes very difficult for them to deregister it, mm -hmm. get it out of the mind. Was it a bang? Was it a scream? Mm -hmm. Was it a screech? Uh -huh. Was it um, a cry? Right. You know. Then the mind registers that so uh, so overwhelmingly that because the brain is alive. You're trying to protect yourself. Yes, basically. the brain is alive, mm -hmm. and so what happened prior to you mm -hmm. feeling the threat to your life remains like etched in mm -hmm. the brain, mm -hmm. and so anything that sounds like that trigger. Right whether it, you're safe or 10 years or five years later, will always mm. re-trigger, right. especially if the person has not gone through uh, what we would call a trauma processing. Mm. And that's where what the- What are the steps of this trauma processing? That's where the issue of uh, trained professionals helping someone out of this situation is becoming such a reality in this time mm -hmm. and processor mm -hmm. 
And I know traditionally, even when this happened, there was a way in which somebody would be put through and they would make sure that person has a support. Uh -huh. And they keep, you know, reminding them that they will be safe. And a lot of spirituality was being put into mm -hmm. it. And sometimes a lot of explanations okay. were being put into the situation. And that has everything to do with helping this person to come to terms. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it, it took almost six months. Mm -hmm. <coughs> three months, months because we've been working wow. with people who have been involved mm -hmm. in that dosita right. it has taken quite a bit in the garissa mm -hmm. so it's a process mm -hmm. that takes time but becomes easier when you have a professional supporting you now what the about process. family because at the end of the day they'll be back home and the family and friends do not probably understand quite uh, well, or maybe mm. they won't, might understand for that week, but then moving on, they might, you know, yeah. assume that mm -hmm. you're better. So how can they be more aware of how to help survivors? Yeah, you, re you remember, uh, that's Gedaiga. Oh, yeah. He said something very, very, very important and critical, mm. that whenever there is an attack, mm -hmm. whenever there is a trauma or an event like what happens, everybody experiences uniquely because there were under underlying issues. Yeah. Remember he's mentioned somebody's father had gone through and everybody's saying get out because yes. to them it's like just escape. Mm -hmm. No, somebody may have gone through any other. Some people, it may have been the very first time mm -hmm. that they are going through this. So the entire family, the entire support system has never been in that space before. Right. Now what we do is we usually empower that person to help the people around them understand what does not help them. Mm. What, when they, what they say, what they do, what they take them through, because it is the person who knows what does not work for them. Yes. So if they want some peace, they want some space, then it is them that are empowered to really tell someone mm -hmm. that I don't like when you joke about this. Right. I don't like when you bang doors mm -hmm. for this time because it just you know, triggers you know, me. triggers mm -hmm. me or makes me get scared. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes it, mm -hmm. it is uh, one of the biggest challenge we have with people supporting those who've gone through trauma right. is we have become a society that is a little bit carefree mm -hmm. in responding to people's needs yes. and feelings, mm -hmm. especially this monster called the social media. Okay. So you find somebody making a joke out of it, somebody, you know, like uh, looking at the survivor like he is mm -hmm. and calling them, you know, referring to them in some mm -hmm. unique or some uh, casual the way, way or the way funny, that but... is funny, but they do not know the magnitude of trauma mm -hmm. and what trauma does. Because if you make any trauma survivor mm -hmm. become like they are hopeless, those are some of the things that could lead someone into depression right. or they would just then see hopelessness. Okay, yeah. so back to you Mr. Mgizaiga. I'd like to read an excerpt uh, from an article on Al Jazeera by a, a, on a survi or several survivors and just as a conclusion and it reminds me of the person you are in that uh, room with. This person says, I feel like the government hasn't learned. She said, my mom is a survivor of the Al-Qaeda claimed 1998 US embassy bombing in Nairobi. I am a survivor of this. More needs to be done. So to you, do you feel that more needs to be done or are we on the right track? Yeah, actually, a lot more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And it's not just government, even companies themselves thinking about what happens if this happens to us. Safety. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even in your own house, their apartment blocks, their malls. Uh, I think what we've seen over time uh, is an escalation of how terror works. Yeah. So now it's in schools, uh, it's going to our universities, it's going mm -hmm. to buses. So you never really know at what point um, terror will find you. Right. So I think both individuals mm -hmm. and uh, companies and then the government mm -hmm. need to do something about a, letting people know what to do in the event, of, the an event attack. of an attack. And then it's also upon you as an individual occasionally to look up mm -hmm. uh, in terms of security. and. Uh, I've seen some of my colleagues, former colleagues, telling me that they'll go into even a nightclub and mm -hmm. ask them, where is your fire exit? Yes, because Where does it to, lead yeah. to? And everybody just tells them, ah, yeah, we, we, do we, sit we, in we, Isha yes. Kitam. Yes. <laughs> so they <laughs> belittle it. But yeah. if it happens, you need to know you where, need that, to know where is. that is. Yeah. Yeah. And back to you, Mrs. Okello, as we wind up, I want to know, um, 
fear is one of the biggest weapon of terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. So how can we guard ourselves from being victims or a scared nation moving forward? Even if you you know somebody or you uh, you were yourself experiencing this, how can we counter that weapon that is fear? Wow, that is extremely challenging mm. because um, especially for survivors and those who are close to the survivors and who experience some of the uh, challenges that people have survived go through. Mm. Um, the best thing that anyone needs to do is to really get a support system. Right. And uh, we are coming to a time that the reality of getting professional support mm. for issues that have got to do with mental health, with psychological issues, is really becoming mm -hmm. a, a critical area. Absolutely. Yes. Now, thank you so much uh, to you both for telling us your story and telling us, helping us understand what goes on after such an attack and the PTSD that comes with it. Um, I wish we had more time for this because it's a much deeper, bigger mm. conversation that needs to be had. But we're going to take a short break for now. And when we come back,